to me, that's so frustrating because it's such a low bar to set. It's like, hey, if you don't like kick us out when we come out to you, then that means that you are an ally. And it's not like ally is an active word. That to me is the base of parenting. I'm not going to give you a gold star because you don't hate your kid for who they are. It takes so much more than that for me to say that someone's an ally. All right, guys, welcome to Queer Talk, number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators in a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. And hey, if you're new listening to this, hit the subscribe button and give us a follow on Spotify. Um, we have a great guest on today. She is a YouTuber, podcaster, a gay girl tip giver. You can find <laughs> her on TikTok at Brianne Williamson underscore. Please welcome Brianne Williamson. Hey, what's up? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on here. So quick question, and I did this. I was literally looking at your Instagram like 10 minutes before this, and you had posted about (laughs) someone who is impersonating you. Someone's trying to be you on dating apps. (laughs) What is that? Uh, Okay, well, I've had people before take my photos and like make Instagram accounts. I've had people use my photos on dating apps, but... From what I've seen, or at least what I know of, people have told me that they're not really interacting with anyone. They maybe just use the photos and like put it up there. Maybe they're just curious to see what they get. That's happened before, but in this case, there is someone on a queer girl dating app that one of the people that DM me said that they've been talking to them for two months. And I've had like six, yeah, I've had like six folks reach out to me and say that... Uh, this same person using my photos um, has been talking to them and asking for like personal contact information and all of that. So like full on catfishing, which is like freaky. And one (laughs) of the girls actually, she's like, it was so weird because I was talking to this girl for a couple of weeks and it like, you know, we were just chatting back and forth. It was fairly casual, um, but I was definitely interested. And then I was just scrolling TikTok and on my For You page, you popped up. And I was like, wait a second. I think that's the person I'm talking to. And so she like went to my page and found my Instagram and DM me and was like, this is really weird. This is the girl who just messaged me actually yesterday, the most recent one. And uh, she's like, this is really weird, but have I been talking to you? on this app and I was like no I'm so sorry so it's freaky because I've contacted the app and like I've done what I can and sharing on my social media that it's not me but there's really nothing you can do so oh my god like it's just like about people finding you and I think that a lot of um mid-range influencers are kind of really susceptible to this because obviously someone's not going to use like an actual celebrity's photos. Like everyone knows who that person is. But when you're a content creator, especially one for like a certain niche, Mm -hmm. most people in the world don't know who I am. So unless you just happen to be one of my followers on TikTok or Instagram, here I am providing like hundreds of photos and all these video clips and stories. It would be so easy to like take my content and basically create another online persona so it's really odd in that way that's super scary but i think it's kind of funny with the dating apps they're like you're not famous enough for us to do anything about it yeah yeah So you're just gonna have to fucking suck it up i know it's so weird i'm like what do you want me to do send you a picture of my id or something like this is me and that's not me yeah i don't know what to do i mean on instagram because i had my account was like Uh, taken down this was like a few years ago when I was traveling and I was posting a bunch of travel content instead of gay content and like they took it down um, for some like sort of reason and I had to do that like I had to provide my ID and my Facebook that was connected to it to get it back up so I feel like if it was something like Instagram like I feel like they should be able to do that I mean they let you you know you know re- open your accounts when they've been banned and shit like that but like that stuff is crazy and especially if it's like a person like obviously that person who's impersonating you like knows you watches your videos i know that's what freaks me out about it because i'm like the person that the people that have been sending me the screenshots and like keep in mind those are just like the six people that have happened to stumble upon me or like already knew who i was so they were like when it came up they're like wait that's brie Mm-hmm. not this person yeah. and screenshot it to me like I can't imagine how many people they're talking to that don't know who the hell I am can I swear on this podcast oh yeah 
Okay. <laughs> all, all bets are off on this podcast. I like to, I like to check. <laughs> all bets are off. <laughs> but yeah, so they, the few people that have screenshotted, like they're using really recent photos and they've apparently, once they've exchanged numbers, been sending like stories as videos and things like that. So they're like actively watching my page. So it was really weird when I posted that yesterday um, in my story, kind of warning people. I was like, this person's going to see that. <gasps> right? Oh. They're going to see that and be like, okay, do I, like, is the gig up? Like, do I stop? Or do I, like, that's what I want to know. Like, does this person see that and go, oh, shit, she, like, found out? Or do they keep going? I'd say most of the people that she's probably, or they're probably catfishing are Mm -hmm. people that don't know you, you know? Because the few people that do, obviously, do it. But, like, is this person in Canada? Like, or is this person, like, trying to catfish out of, like, America or something? Uh, I have no clue. I have no clue. Damn, so. I guess it wouldn't matter if they didn't know you, but like that's just weird. that's some crazy shit. <laughs> that's some, that, but that's also when you know, like even though like you consider yourself a mid-level creator, <laughs> like you there's some level of like, oh shit, someone's impersonating me. Like I, I feel like if someone impersonated me, I'd be like, oh, someone, like, <laughs> if someone's obsessed. With, that's just kind of psycho. But like part of my brain is like, oh my god, that's psycho, and then part of my brain is like, oh my god, that's kind of psycho. You know what? the funny thing is though I was saying to my friends I was like the worst part of this is is that the person that is using my photos and stuff on these dating apps is like really mean <laughs> like all the screenshots that I have for people they're like super like oh like God. they're like a bit of an asshole to people like super abrupt and stuff and I was like listen yeah. if you're gonna try and steal me like at least stick to the brand yeah <laughs> at least, at least be brand. on brand at least be nice <laughs> give some gay girl tips I don't I know. know I'm like <laughs> it's like you it's like worse for me somehow I, and it shouldn't be like why does it make a difference but I'm reading the conversations I'm like this person does not sound cool they do not sound nice yeah. <laughs> so I'm not here for it <laughs> I get that I I would I would be a little pissed at least like you know, if you're gonna impersonate me be be nice about it yeah be a nice person but I guess when you're impersonating someone you don't you could be whoever you want to be because you could be yeah. an asshole and you could be whatever I guess it's just more of like a freedom of like not being like it's yourself not on you yeah yes anonymity of the internet <laughs> yikes y'all make sure that those people are the people that they say they are. <laughs> so, oh, I do have a story about this. I didn't even like connect this when I was I'd originally told you this, but I had had a, um, like a recent date and uh-huh. this person, it was like, we matched and normally like it takes, you know, I don't know. It takes a little bit. Like you match, sometimes you message, mm-hmm. sometimes people message you, sometimes you don't like, there's just this whole thing and it takes forever. And this person messaged like me and then I messaged them back and it was just like, it happened like really fast. And then they were like, Hey, do you want to go on a date later tonight? And it was like spur of the wow. moment, spontaneous. And I originally was going to say no. And I was going to make up an excuse. Cause I'm like, okay, like I do want to go on a date with you, but like, that's a little soon. Yeah. I'm kind of a little bit more of a planner, like not a yeah. huge planner, but like a little bit. And mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, this is like a lot. And then, and then I was like, you know what? I'll be spontaneous. You know, I'm never spontaneous. I'll be spontaneous. Like I'll go. I'll <laughs> say yes. And the, you know, my two friends, like one was like, yes, like fucking go. And the other one was like, make sure that, you know, there's mm-hmm. sex trafficking that's going on in, in Ohio. I'm like, yeah. first of all, it's Northern Ohio. It's not here, but thank you. <laughs> um, like my two like friends are like complete opposites. They're like, make sure she is who she says she is. And then I'm like, well, now you're getting me all anxious. Yeah. And so then I'm like, hey, send, can you like send me a Snapchat? Like, so I know that you're like real. And she's like, oh my God, yeah. And she sends me one. And the first one's blurry. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> I was like, no, Lights it's are doomed. <laughs> yeah, I was like, fuck. No, because she was like walking. And then she uh-huh. sent another one and it wasn't blurry. And then yeah. she's like, here's my Instagram. And then, oh, but, but then she said, here's my second Instagram. And I'm like, wait, why is there a second Instagram? I'm so confused. I'm going from like, okay to like, not okay. To okay to not okay. I'm literally about to leave. And, That's and so it was just like this whole thing. And, but it ended up being fine. Like she was, she, she said she was. <laughs> it's like at that point you like know too much right because like don't you kind of hate that about the online world whether it's dating or making friendships it's like this whole new thing where instead of just meeting someone and then slowly learning about them it's like you've now seen her instagram you've seen her friends you've seen what she posts on tiktok you've seen like whether it's friend or romantic it's like weird you already have this like pre-figured out idea of a person before you even chat with them which is like yeah. so weird to me 
And it's even double worse when you're a creator. And like, I'm definitely not at like at the level of creator that you are, but like, I'm getting to a point where like, I am now worried of people yeah. finding me on Instagram when I am about to go on a date with someone, because I'm afraid that they're going to think some certain way about me because it's happened. Yeah. Like I've had people on dating apps be like, I want to go, like, I want to go on a date with you so I can tell my friends I want on a date with a TikToker. I was like, Oh God. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I was That's like, That's so all, annoying. It was, it's, it's, it wasn't that hard to grow a following. It's not like I'm like, like, yeah, I make funny videos yeah. and they're relatable and I have some sort of talent, but it's not like I am some fucking, like, I'm not on a pedestal. I didn't like that. <laughs> and I was like, mm, okay. It's also weird because <laughs> not only did that person think that, but they thought it was normal enough to tell you that. Which yeah. I think is really odd. You like know? you're using me for clout to just sit, <laughs> using me for a story? Like, oh my God. what the fuck my, am I getting out of that? No kidding. My friends, I've had a couple of my friends go on dates with people. And then while they're on the date, the person will say to them, I noticed that you're friends with Brianne Williamson. And they're like, ah. Yep. <laughs> And then they're like immediately like so turned off because they're like, okay, well now, even if you just men mean it genuinely, mm -hmm. now there's like no way of me to differentiate whether like you just want to like be friends with like our friend group or if you actually like want to date me. So it's weird. Yeah. And then it's like, for that other person too, it's like, well, how do you bring that up? You know what I mean? Like, do you bring it up on the first time you talk to someone if they were yeah. like a good friend of yours? Like, do you bring it up on the first date or do you wait until there's a connection and then you're like, hey, by the way, I knew you were friends with this person. Like, how do you bring that up to where it doesn't look suspicious or you're not yeah. trying to like, so it's because it's either you're going to not say it and keep it in and there's a little bit of yeah. deception there. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. I didn't really think about it that way. Cause that's true. Like if someone followed me and then they just like genuinely wanted to date one of my friends. Yeah. But then like, when do they like, when do they say that? I guess there's no winning in that situation. I don't know. No, there isn't. There, I feel like there isn't, I yeah. guess. I don't know. That's, it is kind of interesting, but. It's, yeah, it's strange. But yeah, that shit is crazy. It's really, it's really nuts. And I remember when I first was on TikTok and I was like looking at all these people who had like 20, 30K followers and I was like, oh my God, like, yeah. can you put people on a pedestal? And then, and then I got there and I was like, everyone's normal and everyone just actually like most, <laughs> now that I know like a lot of influencers, are like they're all the same and not the yeah. same, but like they're just normal people with their own shit and. There's always, totally. there's always something and it, it brings mm -hmm. people down to, to a regular level. But, uh, I remember my first year going to a social media like convention. This one was Buffer Festival in Toronto. Um, it was for YouTube. And I, it was like seeing behind the fog screen for the first time because I knew that a lot of the uh, YouTube creators attending were people that I thought were like so awesome and I loved their content. I loved their mm -hmm. online persona. I assumed they were going to be like the sickest people ever. Yeah. And then I went and that was the case for some, but a lot, it, it could not be more opposite. Like they were mm -hmm. either really rude or they were just nothing like their online persona. And it was like very clicky. And I nice. just remember thinking like, whoa, like this is so crazy that these people that I've been like watching and kind of like looking up to and like, yeah, like putting on a pedestal, like being yeah. like, these people are so cool and down to earth and amazing and like would totally want to be my friend. Yeah. We're like the opposite. <laughs> and it was like such a bummer because it kind of like, I was a creator at the time, like I was invited to go to the festival, but I was I was just starting and it was also like, I was really excited like as a fan to meet a lot of these people. And then it kind of like took that away. And I was like, that's so, such a bummer. So I like definitely like took from that. Like I never want to be that person because yeah. I just find that to be like such a shame. But it is true. Like you, you say, like it doesn't matter where you're at. And there's like always kind of that carrot. Like you always think like people have more followers. And it's like unfortunate situation with social media because you literally can see the numbers. So it's so easy to compare yourself to other people and oh, be yeah. like, oh, that person must be cooler or like better looking or like whatever it may be because they have more followers. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like to tell people sometimes that I'm like, when you meet them in person, they might not all be that cool because it kind of reminds yeah. you that like, they're not like followers isn't everything. Like, you know, yeah. it's just a number. Yeah, it really is. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, you can be a creative person, you can be an uplifting person and, and you can show like a certain portion of yourselves. And that's why I, like I tell my listeners, cause like, I get DMs, I get all this stuff and I see, you know, other creators in the comment section and, and stuff like that. And I like want to warn people not to like idealize 
these people mm-hmm. that they see on the internet because it's only a certain portion of themselves. Moreover, like it's a lot of the time with, with people who are showing a one dimensional view, like it's the mm-hmm. view they want to be the only view or the mm-hmm. view that's going to get them validation, like whatever. And it's like, you have to read the room and the intentions and like of people and, yeah. and stuff like that. And so I never want people to be like looking up in that sort of way. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. it's just not, I don't know. It just yeah. uh, doesn't work. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, that's crazy stuff. So um, I had looked at some of your YouTube videos. I had seen them like a while back. I was really into YouTube, like back when I had first started coming to terms with my sexuality. And this was like yeah. back in 2015. And I watched cool. like consecutively more than anything like Netflix or anything like that um, for like a few years after that. Mm-hmm. And so I had stumbled across some of your stuff. You had started posting, I don't know, maybe a few years ago. It was but, probably right around that time, like yeah. I think 20, end of 2015, 2016, kind of, yeah. But I saw your short film. Um, and so when I was researching for this episode, I re- like when I looked at your page, I was like, oh my God, I remember seeing that short film uh, that you did. And it was such a good fucking short film. And that's why it probably blew up. I think it had like over a million views or something like that. Yeah, um, I was super excited about how the, the response to that. I never expected it. So it was really cool. Yeah. So how did you end up wanting to do a short film? Like, did, I didn't really know your background with YouTube. Like, did you kind of start making videos or did you start in like a video projection making like short films and then kind of get into YouTube? So I had no experience making short films or anything okay. like that. Okay. I started um, with YouTube honestly my first video was a coming out video and it was kind of my way to like rip off the band-aid of anyone in the town that i grew up in that i hadn't like directly been able to tell my story to i was getting frustrated because you know it happens you start telling certain people about who you are and then it's like the telephone game like i was hearing all these crazy adaptations of my sexuality and who I was and people like debating it in my town and people I went to high school with debating it. And it was really frustrating to me. So I'm like, I can't sit down with every single person, nor do I want to (laughs) give that emotional energy to that. Um, But what I can do instead of people just like filling in the gaps for themselves and like doing all this guesswork is make a coming out video on YouTube. And it was kind of my way of like ripping the bandaid off and being like, this is my story. This is how I want to tell it. And I knew obviously because people like love the gossip that people mm-hmm. were going to see that I posted it and like watch it and probably share it with friends, but that's like exactly what I wanted. So that's kind of how it started. Honestly, is just like a way for me to kind of get that over with. And, um, it's interesting that it came full circle for my short film coming out because my whole frustration with why I started YouTube was that I felt like it was so annoying that I kept having to tell people about my sexuality. And I was Mm -hmm. like, if I make a coming out video, then it'll just be over, then it'll be done. And I was, I quickly realized that that was not the case, that I was going to have to be coming out for the rest of my life. And that's kind of the premise of my short film coming out. And I needed that story when I was younger because I remember being so frustrated by it that I always had to explain myself. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was never really shown in media in TV and film. Um, It was always kind of this like one big moment, one sit down family dinner. um, And then the person was out and like life was good or life was bad, but they never really spoke about how like that was going to be something that you would always have to do at grocery stores and at the doctor's office. And, um, when you meet new friends or new clients. So I wanted to put a piece of media out there that represented that, but I had never made a short film and I knew nothing about it. So I had this idea in my head and I'm definitely a thinker. Like I'm not someone who really like writes things down. I just have these like ideas in my mind. And I went to, um, I just Googled like different options and I ended up going to this one place that I knew I could rent for a set and I booked the set and the only time they had available was like two weekends away. And I was like, Oh, that's really soon. But again, I knew nothing about making a short film. So I was like kind of ignorant to like how soon that was. And then I went home and they were like, okay, so here's the contract to sign off on booking the set. But all we need first for us to sign off is a copy of the script just to make sure that it doesn't go against any of our like beliefs or anything yeah. else. And I was like, oh fuck, I need a script. <laughs> I didn't even, I hadn't even written anything down. Yeah. So I literally sat there in an hour. I just like wrote the script. I like on Microsoft Word, looked up the template for script, <laughs> <laughs> nothing about it. And I just like, just 
kind of like word vomited everything I'd been like thinking in all these different situations. And then I started just DMing people on Instagram that had hashtag Vancouver film. And a lot of people gave me no's, but that's one thing I'm not afraid of is getting no's. So I, I didn't really care about that. And a lot of people thought I was absolutely crazy because most people that make short films, you know, plan for months. And yeah. I was like, hey, do you want to, at this point, it was like a week before. I was like, hey, do you want to be my uh, cinematographer um, a week from today? <laughs> and they're like, what? And it was just kind of crazy. I cast the film. Like, I didn't actually, like, properly cast it at all. I just... I asked a few friends that were stand-up comedians, so I knew they'd be able to deliver a line. I had some friends of friends that were in acting. It just kind of like, weirdly, like I didn't sleep for two weeks and I just made it happen. Yeah. And then I think that I'm really actually stoked that I didn't know how much work goes into it because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have done it, if I'm being yeah. honest. Like, I think it's so easy to talk yourself out of things when you don't know how to do something, especially when you know how much goes into it. Yep. Um, so because I was kind of like, committed and I had already like paid money out of my pocket to like book the set and book all these people to come I was like well it's happening this is <laughs> this is it yeah. so we got to make it happen and then um because of that I was able to do something without the kind of mindset of being a producer and trying to like limit it like I always say now if I was going to do another short film I totally understand why people write a short film that has two characters in one kitchen because yeah. I, like my, the first short film I did is only, I think eight minutes long and there's like 10 different sets and each set has different actors and all these different things. So it was just so yeah. much work for my first, but because I did that now, I know it's possible. And uh, it went on to get some good success. I got into sh some short film festivals and um, yeah, I think it's over 1.2 million on YouTube now, which I'm like really stoked about. So yeah. Wow, that's so crazy. I love that story because you don't have to have all of the tools to do what you want to do, no. you know, especially in really. the online world. And, and, you know, you're living in a big city in Vancouver, you mm -hmm. have some sort, you like, you knew some people that were in the industry, but you, you did something, you had an idea and you made yeah. it happen. And like, there is a little bit of planning that can go into it. But when some, I feel like when you're doing something new, you have to just start. Like the main yes. thing is to just fucking do it totally. and then refine it as you go along. Like the yeah. hardest part of like starting something new or something that you're uh, going in a little bit of the, into the unknown with something mm -hmm. and not knowing if it's going to work out, like really hinders people and people don't want to get into it. And so totally. like, like you said, like if you had known all the work that went into it or you had sat <laughs> down with someone yeah. who had just done their first short film, like, would you have done it? I probably would have talked myself on it. Actually, I don't know at this point, but definitely I would say a few years ago, I would have talked myself out of it. I used to be like a really big perfectionist and I, I wanted anything that I put out into the world to be perfect, but nothing's ever going to be perfect and you're never going to be an expert at anything. No. So now, yeah, when anyone asks me for advice on like how to start anything creative or get into social media or make short films or whatever it may be, I'm like, just try, honestly. Yep. First of all, just go for it because everyone starts somewhere. And second of all, I think it goes a long way to admit that you don't know certain things and yeah. ask for help and trust people who do know because um, that is definitely something that has been difficult for me in the past. Like I used to be a perfectionist and a control freak. Great combo. <laughs> Woo, super cute. Uh, yeah. I was like a nightmare in uh, school group projects. Like basically just did the whole thing and like handed out the parts. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but now now I'm like wow there's like so much value in like seeing other people being like amazing at something and just empowering them to not only do what they do best but also like teach you along the way like I was so lucky with my short film to be able to say for example to my set designer like hey this is what I want but I know you are the expert at it so I'm going to trust you and people really love when you trust them it's something yeah. they are passionate about and good at um, so I think a lot of like what I've learned a lot about leadership is that like if you give someone the opportunity to show you how awesome they are like they'll show yeah. you yeah so they really just will. start also, just go for it. It's so fun. Yeah. The adrenaline is great when you don't know what you're doing and you just have to do it. Like it's great.
Oh, yeah. And it's all bets are off because even if, like, it fucking sucked, you were just like, well, it's my first time anyway. Yeah. So, you're like, like what? What the fuck? <laughs> you're like, well, what do you expect? It was my first one. I don't know anything. Like, who cares? Exactly. Like, the yeah. worst case scenario is it turns out the way that you might think it turns out or people might think it turns out. And it, and even people in the industry, if you're ever worried about, like, oh, well, someone did this and now they're going to think, well, they're just going to be like, well, it's your first time. So, it's okay. Yeah. But if you do better, any incrementally, anything that's yeah. incrementally better than mm -hmm. the baseline, everyone's like, oh my God, your <laughs> first thing and you did this. Like, wow, that's so amazing. Yeah. And then it's just an ego boost and you just totally. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, I feel, I felt like that when I had started making videos too on TikTok. Like, to be honest, I uh, didn't like have any background in any of that. And like, mm -hmm. I just started, I just started because I was like, oh my God, I was so enamored by the community. I had never seen a community yeah. like, like, a, like a queer community like I did on TikTok. And I was just yeah. like, fuck it. Like, I'm going to make videos. This is, this will be fun. Like mm -hmm. no one follows me yet. So it doesn't even matter. Nobody sees this yeah. shit. Like it is what it is. And then I had, had a couple viral videos and I was like, oh my God. Yes. I love it. Holy shit. People are connecting to my content. Like it's super relatable, which uh -huh. is just really nice to feel that you're going through something that everyone else understands as well. Yeah. And then it creates subculture and side conversations and like little, totally. like it's just like crazy, the community that you can create on social media and, mm -hmm. and you don't have to have any, I mean, shit, I give unqualified advice in this podcast and like, yeah. I, I love being an underdog. I think it's great to like have, and just say, Hey, like mm -hmm. all bets are off. Like this is, yeah. this is unqualified advice from my experience. Take mm -hmm. it or fucking leave it. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's when you declare yourself, like, I am, uh, <laughs> I am a short film, you know, maker, you yes, know, and then you know. can dig yourself into a fucking hole if you have something that's Definitely. terrible. I know. We always say on, uh, I have a podcast with, called I Can Explain Podcast uh, with my co-host, Sean, who's a gay man. And we always say, like, we are one lesbian and one gay man. These are our <laughs> opinions based on our, our one experience as a queer person. Yes. Like, and it's, it, you know, it's not going to work for everybody, but we're just going to, like, hopefully you'll relate to the stories that we tell. And I, I kind of love that. I think that, that there has been a problem with media in the past that, they think that one story kind of covers it all, right? Like, they're like, why do you need more gay movies? You have a gay movie. <laughs> As yeah. if that, like, is going to work or connect to everybody. Yeah. And the really cool thing that I'm seeing on TikTok is because there are so many LGBTQ plus folks on there that have totally different stories and looks and personalities, like, no matter what, there's somebody that someone's going to relate to. Like someone's exactly. going to be able to connect to somebody. Yeah. Um, and that's really powerful because representation is everything. Like I wish I had it when I was growing up. So I think it's really cool. I know. I mean, we had a little bit. We had the early, you're in your mid to late 20s? Yeah, I'm 28. Okay. 20. Okay, I'm 26. So yeah, we had like the early YouTube Mm -hmm. And so there were some early queer YouTubers, yeah. um, which was nice. You know, the OG, like Hannah Hart. Everyone knows Hannah Hart. Yeah. And I'm sure, and there were some other ones too. Like Miles McKenna's been on there for fucking ever. Yeah. Uh, Miles he's is like, amazing. Yeah. He seems like a super cool dude. And he was on for like a long yeah. time. I had watched some of his videos and like CB5, he's been on there for a while. There's just so many mm. like OGs and like BuzzFeed. I, yeah. I love the BuzzFeed cast of like, it was like, I don't know, like the 2013, 2015s, yeah. and then some of them got fired and they all like left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they're all like, I feel like super successful. And those were the people that I looked up to, like uh -huh. the, like Brittany Ashley, Ashley Perez, like Amanda mm -hmm. Holland, all of those people, like they were the people that I fucking watched all the time. Like I watched BuzzFeed, I followed them on every other channel. Mm -hmm. I still keep up with them to this day, but like. Those are the Amanda people, right? Holland is amazing. I always like to give credit when someone like shouts out a creator and I've met them in person and they're genuinely just as awesome. And Amanda yeah. Holland is one of them. Like so awesome. Just a good person all around and very helpful to like smaller creators. Like it's been really cool to me and stuff. So she that. seems like it. She really yeah. does. Like the way that she's created her community with like drunk lesbians watch and, yeah. and then like she, they had a podcast at one point that I listened to. It was like mm -hmm. where they read like erotic fan fiction or something like that. <laughs> and like that shit was just fun. It was like niche, you know, it wasn't just yeah. like your, the, the stuff that you see all the time, you know, it mm -hmm. was like, 
just being queer and just reading queer fiction and yeah. and stuff like that. But like with with Amanda, I could just see it with the way that she like handled mm-hmm. her community and like totally. wanted to get the opinions and, and cared about those and like and stuff like yeah. that. Like she, yeah. So I can I can see where you're coming from on that. But some mm-hmm. people, like you said, like you probably just never know. Like you think that they're going to be super cool and they and end up like, not be, and you're like, oh fuck. I know. But it's weird. It, I think that's the the brunt as that some creators have to take. And I think that's what happens with like movie stars and celebrities. I can only assume like when, you know, you have these great classics and, or these movies that people love, like these cult classics and Mm -hmm. you realize how you see how the meat's made, you see how it's made. And so it, it takes away some of that. I don't know the, the allure of it because you now know, but like, I don't know. Would you take it back? Would you take it back? (sighs) I like it but also like I am such a person I like to call people out like I don't because I have to like zip my fucking trap every <laughs> once in a while yeah but there are things that I like meet certain people um that I'm like not only do I think that they're not exactly how they present online but they say something that's like racist or um <coughs> <you know>. <coughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few others that you might not expect, let me tell you. Um, and like, you know, maybe uh, whether it be transphobic or biphobic or whatever it is. And then I see people like worship, worshiping them online without knowing that yeah. about them. Yep. And like seeing them, especially like younger people as like some queer hero. And it's actually frightening to me because I'm like, oh my God, like this is the person that these people are like looking to to emulate and like maybe um you know for advice and it stresses me out because I'm like this person is not like that and I'm just it worries me honestly so there's like this fine line between me being like you know what it's not my place and I'm obviously not gonna like have a conversation with them and then go like light them up online to a certain extent yeah but um it does get frustrating sometimes like sometimes I like wish I didn't know the behind the scenes Mm -hmm. because I'm like, once you know, it's so, it's impossible to unsee. So then yeah. everything just looks so phony. So it's like yeah. hard. I get that. I mean, yeah, it is hard. It is fun to know the tea though. I will say it was yeah. really fun to be the all, not the all knowing of things, <laughs> but to have the inside scoop. But at the same time, there's a burden yeah. that comes with the responsibility of knowing those kinds of things. And then just seeing the shit happen and not really being able to do much about it and, yeah. and stuff like that. And oh, fuck. Crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Yeah. I have a few people. I have a few people in my head that I am that I'm wondering about. If it's like gonna connect. <laughs> but I'm not gonna put you on the spot. On the spot. <laughs> oh my but god. I do, I do. Because I think sometimes you can see through the lens now that I've like been a little bit not to the extent of like anyone notable, but like to the point where I can sometimes see mm-hmm. little, little little things if you pay close attention. <laughs> Little There's glimmers. Little, mm-hmm. little, little of the mask coming off. Yeah. You know? Slips a little bit. Yeah. Oh, so, I, I, I get it. But yeah, so Brie, you had, you've been posting a lot of stuff on Instagram when you've had like the board and you talk about like a lot of in-depth things regarding the queer community in general. And one mm-hmm. of them um, really hit home with me was like the difference between like people being an ally and people just not being actively homophobic. And yeah. that shit really spoke to me because I feel like queer people take any sign of not being homophobic as like amazing. Like yeah. anybody who's not like like a complete shit bag, it's just like, oh my God, yeah. that's it's great. You know, like you, we take what we can get kind of thing. Totally. Cause that's all we've known, you know, mm-hmm. in in a variety of like settings and stuff like that. And so um what's kind of your take on that? Because it's something that I feel like needs to be talked about. Like, because allies does not mean that you're just because you're actively homophobic doesn't mean you're an ally. Yeah. So basically for me, I get really frustrated when like people just get like handed out the hero badge just yeah. because they like don't hate their kid because they're gay and or just because their friend's gay and they're not like using the F slur or the D slur. To me, that's so frustrating because it's such a low bar to set for yes people outside of the LGBTQ plus community that's like, hey, if you don't like beat us up or hate us or kick us out when we come out to you or, you know, abandon us from your family, um, the list goes on, then that means that you are an ally. And it's not like ally is an active word 
to me. It does not mean that you just are not being explicitly homophobic or transphobic. To me, it's someone who is actively doing the opposite. So it's not just like this weird neutral ground, um, which I think we give a lot of people the past. And like you said, I think historically that was something to reach for because people were more outwardly actively homophobic and transphobic and the idea of anyone being accepting was really exciting for the LGBTQ plus community and also folks outside of the LGBTQ plus community saw that person as like a wow they're really like leading the pack and what a kind soul to accept their kid despite it all and then now I'm just like getting really frustrated by that like I see videos all the time pop up about like how amazing these parents are because their kids trans and they like let them be who they are and I'm like that to me is the base of parenting like I'm not I'm not gonna give you a gold star because you don't hate your kid for who they are who they tell you they authentically are and um to me it takes so much more than that for some for me to say that someone's an ally. Um, To me, an ally is someone who, when it doesn't benefit them, is gonna put their neck out for the LGBTQ plus community. Whether that be through standing up for someone, um, even when it might be embarrassing to do so, you know, if one of your buddies at a party makes a joke um, that's inappropriate, even though there's no one else who's LGBTQ plus in the room, are you going to stand up and like set that right? Even when no one's going to give you a pat on the back for it. Are you donating to LGBTQ plus organizations, supporting LGBTQ plus businesses, hiring LGBTQ plus folks? Like there's so many things that are active choices that to me make an ally. And I think it's just like such an old school way of thinking to say someone's just an amazing person because they don't like hate who we are. I think that queer people need to stand up that they deserve better. We fucking deserve better than that. Like we deserve Mm -hmm. more than like the bare fucking minimum. I think it is unfortunate that people do get a pass in these things. And I do think it's unfortunate that parents think that it's almost like, oh, you're into this similarly to be like, oh, you're gay. So we're going to sometimes think of your thoughts and feelings uh similarly to like oh you're into art this is something that you're interested (laughs) in art like let me buy you like a pencil set for christmas (laughs) and it was on clearance it was just it wasn't even the main gift it was like just a little gift because you like got your sister too much stuff and we need to like (laughs) add up the tally just a little bonus it's just like a little bonus Mm -hmm. and uh you know it's like like almost looked at as almost like a trait or like a (laughs) hobby than it is like a core part of your identity that you've been like hiding that's like deprived and needs like validation And I think for people to just be like, oh yeah, like we're cool with you being gay and like, but they're not actively trying to get to know that portion of you Uh and because they think that they already know you. And so like my coming out experience, I'll be like very candid, was like that. It was like, oh yeah, like we accept you, blah, blah. I never, I didn't have like people who were like, no, we don't accept you. Like Mm -hmm. the worst thing was like my grandparents were just like, we don't understand or yeah. like agree but like we love you with the best for you so like we're mm-hmm. just happy if you're happy kind of thing and that was just like fine I was okay with that totally. but it was like with my parents it it was one of those things where I was kind of like when I came out I was like what is it really how I think it's gonna be mm-hmm. or is it gonna you know and and it was you know where it was just like a hey look at this um new thing that's on and it's about um you guys have rights And that's really cool. We re-recorded it for you, which I liked. I really, it it really was nice, but it's kind of like here and there stuff. Like, it's Uh just like, oh yeah, this thing is on Fox News. And it, (laughs) wow, it's crazy. It's crazy. Gay people are on Fox News. Like, oh my God, like, like, I'm so glad you recorded it. And I watch Fox News. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I can't wait to dive right in to Fox. But it, it was one of those things where I, I, think that my parents mean well but they're conservative Mm -hmm. they're republicans they're Mm -hmm. not allies they're not Mm -hmm. actively homophobic but they're not Mm -hmm. allies they're not going to march in a pride parade they're not Mm going to vote for biden if because it doesn't um benefit them to do that Mm -hmm. even if it might benefit me but uh you know they're just it's just not going to happen and so like i've had so many conversations with them about Mm -hmm. this you know what i mean and about blm like 
you can't just say that you had a black friend spend the night and it was your yeah. first friend spend the night and that's the reason why you're not racist. Like, yeah. it's so nice that you're not actively racist. Thank God. Yeah. That would mm -hmm. be really rough for me to have a relationship with you. But, yeah. like, you know, it, it's totally. just like... Like, I have black friends, or I had a black roommate. It's like, who gives a rat's ass? <laughs> yeah, I know. Jesus Christ. And it's no crazy. Way. But that's what people, like, I think that in some ways, for many years, people have been given that out of that, like, low bar. Yeah. So they think, I'm a good person if I'm not, like, actively hating on a cer certain marginalized group. Oh, yeah. And that's just not good enough anymore. Like I not. say, you know, anyone who didn't, anyone who voted for Trump, first of all, is not an ally. Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what else, what else you do. Yeah. Because being yeah. an ally is like, even when it's not beneficial to you, how are you voting? Like yeah. my example here in BC and Canada, um, I am not indigenous. However, when I'm voting, I'm taking into account indigenous rights, yeah. even if those rights are going to, you know, make me pay higher taxes, even if it's yeah. not going to necessarily benefit directly my life or might even like take away something from my life. Being an ally is saying that does not matter because this group deserves equal rights and they deserve to be treated like other people. I think our standards as a community need to be higher of what we call an ally. I think that there's a lot of that in the celebrity world that people, um, you know, like people will be like, oh, that celebrity is in a movie with this gay co-star and they posted a picture on Instagram. So they're an ally, like gay rights. They love them. And I'm like, yeah. No, they've never done an interview where they're talking about LGBTQ plus rights. They're not using their platform to like help. I think that we need to change that bare minimum standard for sure. I completely agree. You have to do the right thing, even if it doesn't directly benefit you. And I think that's a hard thing for any human to do mm -hmm. is to vote. They, you know, you vote in your best interest, right? They tell you to vote in your best interest. Yeah. But they fail to recognize, like, your best interest is, like, hurting other people. It's not mm -hmm. just, like, oh, I'm voting for my own benefits. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you're actively, at least, you know, in these campaigns and in this political climate and whatever, like, in this climate in general, like, you are hurting people by voting in your best interest. Like, yeah. I, I voted for all of the levies in my area. Mm -hmm. So that is going to raise my taxes. I don't mm -hmm. have kids, yeah. But I'm going to vote for it because I feel like they need more resources because the educational system is fucked up and like yeah. these kids will run the the world at some point and I'm going to be old and decrepit and it would be nice <laughs> to know that they have like a nice education. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Couldn't agree more. But, Could not agree more. But yeah, people are, it's really hard. And I think it's a little bit easier if you have a friend or a family member mm -hmm. who is a part of a minority group to then kind yeah. of give you perspective on that. Mm -hmm. but it's sometimes still not enough. It's still not no. enough to have someone in your family who is disabled, someone who is a part of the BIPOC community, BIPOC, BIPOC, BIPOC community. I've never said that out loud. Well, yeah. yeah <laughs> POC, you know, like just people of color um, or any other minority. It, mm -hmm. it, it's hard. And, but it, I think with minorities, it's easier for one minority to, to understand because mm -hmm. on some level, being disenfranchised and at whatever level it is, you understand to a certain degree and you're like. Yeah. You can relate to the need for empathy. Like you can relate yes. to the power that it holds for someone outside of your group yes. to put out a helping hand or to say like, I've got your back. Exactly. Um, anyone who's been, you know, marginalized in any way knows that feeling when someone who is not affected by what you're going through and your experiences, for example, for me as a queer person, like, having people outside of that group say, I've got you, like mm -hmm. that holds power. Cause often the people that minds need to be changed, they will listen to those people more than they will listen to the marginalized group itself. So yep. I think that everyone has a responsibility to say, how can I use my privilege to change the minds of people? Because exactly. the people in the group themselves shouldn't have to do all the work. I am so shocked disgustingly shocked at the fact that with this American election, there are more white women who voted for Trump than voted for Trump in 2016. It makes what my is, brain hurt. It makes my brain fucking hurt. I don't, I just, I've lost for words, genuinely. Like you're part of the biggest minority. We are a minority in a yeah. majority of women. There are more women in the world than men, uh -huh. right? So, but 
we are a minority because we've been oppressed for so long and yeah. people within our community have been even more so oppressed, especially mm-hmm. than white women. But the fact that like white women are, are <sighs> actively supporting someone who is racist, like how does that happen specifically because we're the ones that are supposed to be, we're the ones who have a problem with white supremacy. We're the ones who need to be changing this shit. And it seems like it's taking, it seems like it's going downhill. It's so and I don't painful. know. I don't know what the fuck is going on with it. Crazy, what? crazy, crazy stuff. But yeah. we'll see. I wonder if there's going to be some answers to that. My my only assumption is like people, like white women, feeling like they're being attacked or something or or what, and they're like sticking to the Karens know. of the world are choked. Yeah. Their feelings are hurt. <laughs> they are. They're fucking butt hurt. <laughs> butt hurt about it, and they're fucking khakis. <laughs> goddamn khakis their hairspray i swear to god (laughs) um (laughs) well we'll go to a question with the queers okay um all right guys so this is our segment question with the queers um where we answer a listener submitted question with our unqualified advice on this (laughs) podcast so this question comes from peyton they're 27 they're from montana and they write Hi, Brie. I was hoping you and another lovely TikToker could shed some light on a situation I am having. Good, because there's two Brie's here. Double the trouble. Yes. <laughs> I love that. The Brie I, squad. The Brie squad. Let's go. Mm-hmm. She says, I am a shy girl that has just gotten out of their first queer relationship. I had recently come out before dating this person, and I thought that they were the one. It's been a couple months, and I feel like I should be moving on dating etc. But every time I go onto a dating app and start matching, I just cannot follow up to go on a date with anyone. Well, hey, it's not just you. It's yeah. just Don't worry. Yeah. You're part of the majority. <laughs> it's not that they're not attractive or interesting to me, but getting out there, quote unquote, has never really been my thing. And I'm still hurting over this breakup. I want to move on and start dating other people and experiencing new things. Any advice on how I can move past this and start living my life? Well, first of all, Peyton, I think it's like super normal how you're feeling. I think people underestimate the difference of a queer relationship, like the first queer relationship that somebody has, opposed to maybe a heterosexual relationship, because not only is it your like first love or the first person you like, but it's also the first person that you get to be your authentic self with, that for most people, you were hiding that for a long time of your life. So finally, not only do you get to say, hey, here's who I am, but you get to like take action about it. You're like, yeah. you know, for me, I'm a lesbian. So for me, I got to be like, oh my gosh, I've been hiding that I'm a lesbian my whole life. And then now I get to actively be myself with uh-huh. this girl that I never honestly thought or I second guess for a lot of my life whether I would ever actually be able to do that openly um so I think it holds deeper weight and so I think that's like just totally normal so just validate the, that feeling I think a lot of people that are queer can relate to their first love kind of like having some sort of extra depth in the sense of like a a moment in your life. But I also think it's important to separate that because I think a lot of people don't get over their first relationship that are LGBTQ because they cannot differentiate the feeling of excitement that they got to be themselves for the first time and how Mm -hmm. magical that felt with that actual person. So something that I suggest is writing down a list of like what made you feel wonderful in that relationship and trying to separate whether it was specifically that person and that relationship was great because of them or if that relationship felt amazing because it was your first queer relationship and you finally got to be you and that can sometimes like help you move on um i also think you've only been single by the sounds of it for two months which is like i think there's this weird thing in um the women loving women community that people like move on so quickly. So two months seems like a long time, but I was always of the opinion that like sometimes it's better just to wait longer and just do you in between and uh, figure out what you want and not just kind of settle. So if you're not, if you're not in it right now, like if you're not feeling it, don't like put pressure on wanting to go on a date because like you're just as gay when you're single. You're just, you're just, you know, cause I, I find yeah. it like there's this weird pressure online that like people like, I think cause of all the like 
LGBTQ plus couples on TikTok and all this stuff that they think that in some way, like having a significant other validates their sexuality uh -huh. because they get to like physically show it. They're like, look, I'm gay. And like, here it is. Yeah. So like, it's not going to take anything away from your queer experience to just figure yourself out for a while. That's mm -hmm. my advice. I love that. I think that's really great. And I do agree. I think people do like try to move on quickly and try to regain that sense of whatever they were you know, had in that previous relationship that they don't have anymore. And there's positives and negatives to it, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you left the relationship or was the one who got broken up with the dumper, or the dumpy, but like either way, <laughs> there's pros and cons to it. And, mm. and I'm sure that you're, you know, thinking about the pros and, and shit like that. I feel like after relationships, especially your, your first queer relationship, they always yeah. have a special place. Yeah. In, in your hearts, regardless totally. if you're friends with them or if you talk with them, you might not have any contact with them, but there's always, they're always kind of there. And it does take a little bit. And I don't want to speak from like too much experience because that happened to me like 10 months ago. <laughs> okay. so, I can only speak to 10 months no. <laughs> of that happening. And I will say it gets better. At this yeah. point in time, there, at least, and I'm just speaking to my experience, there is a, just that little part that's like mm -hmm. every person, I'm kind of doing a little comparison. Yeah. It, and that's honest, right? Like, I think yeah. a lot of people relate to that. Yeah. And it's not that I am still in love with her or I want to get back together with her. Mm -hmm. There's none of that. But there's still this little bit of like, and, and I think that there's a fine line. I don't know if I'm crossing it or not, to be honest. I think I'll figure that out as time goes <laughs> on. And I think as time goes on and you get into other, other relationships, you know, when you do find love again and, and stuff like that, um, where you can finally have more of uh, a comparison of like, are you putting mm -hmm. this person on a pedestal because they were your first queer relationship or were they yeah. really a good person that you took a lot of good things from or maybe a little bit of both and it'll probably take time and I wish I could tell you for definite, <laughs> definitely, yeah. but that's where I'm at like personally with that. Um, but yeah, I would say what I, what I do is I try and, and take the good parts and I try not to forget the the bad parts or the things yeah. that you don't want to take into the next relationship. Cause I feel like you can idealize someone totally um, regardless of how it ended and be like, Oh, I really want that. I really want this again. And it'll never mm -hmm. be just like that, but you can no. take what you learned from it. You can take the good things and you can be like, that, those are the things I want to look for in a, in a next partner. And that's what I have to say on that. I concur. I concur. The breeze concur. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, let's go ahead and go on to our lightning round. I got some new questions today, guys. I, I've been getting people in the DMs that are like, can you switch up the lightning round questions? And, That's funny. And so I did. I switched up the lightning round questions. Um, even though people give random and different answers, but we want different yeah. questions. So I, I'm giving okay. you different, different questions. I've okay. only done one lightning round on a podcast before, and it was on a very, like, heteronormative podcast and they were asking me like what's your favorite facial moisturizer what's oh. your favorite and the whole time I was just like uh like I had no idea what to say so funny. I'm like a vino or like, <laughs> I, was like I don't know like I I have no idea uh, my it's body funny. wash I don't yeah know. <laughs> coffee or tea coffee cake or cookies cookies king princess or Kailani oh Kailani <laughs> Jean jackets or flannels? Jean jackets. All right. Beanies or snapbacks? Beanies. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving. Are you the gay that squishes the bugs? Yes. Ah. But I don't squish them. I just put them outside. <laughs> so you interact with the bugs. <laughs> I, I'm the one who takes care of the bugs. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so for toilet paper, do you roll it under or do you roll it over? It's a very important question. Over. Okay. Okay. I don't agree with you. I think it's weird. But <gasps> we'll get past it. Maybe it's no. a Canadian thing. Are you serious? Over? Like, I'm under. I go under. It stresses me out when it's under. I just put it, I put this question on because I just had to put a new roll on and I was like, this is funny. I'll put it on there. Yeah, no. Um, it's favorite. Okay. First of all, did you watch season eight of Are You the One? Yes. Favorite character, favorite reality character from that? Oh God, I can't remember any of their names. Um, who did I think was really 
fun and awesome. There was that queer, um, non-binary drag person that I was like totally enamored with. Basit. It's Basit, right? Okay, yes. Yeah, Basit. I, I put this on here because I just watched it. I'm just a year late and I watched it and I thought it would be fun. But yeah, I, I Basit's probably one of my favorite characters because they're like just so woke and like they yeah. just, they're probably one of the most, they were one of the most mature people on the entire thing, So You know what? I loved that show, like that season, because it was such like so groundbreaking for so many reasons. Mm-hmm. But I also think, and I feel for the folks on it because like obviously they had a lot of expectations to live up to because it was the first time a reality show had kind of given that platform to um, all queer folks. But I, I think a lot of people and myself, there was like, I put extra pressure on the people yeah. more so than I do other reality TV contestants. Yeah. And I wanted so much from them. And like so many people, when they were making certain choices, I was like, no, this is such a bad look. But like Jenna, no, like don't yeah. go back to, like, come on. Uh, what's his face? I forget his fucking name. Um, yeah. But I mean, at the same time though, then I had to take that hat off and be like, usually when I'm watching reality TV, I love the drama and I love all of that. So yeah. it's fun to watch. So it's, they had a lot of pressure on them because they were the first like all queer cast. Yeah. And I think they put pressure on themselves too, to make sure that they like had a good season so that yeah. more queer seasons could ensue. Absolutely. Like, I really liked it though, because it was, I actually learned something. I don't ever learn something from reality shows. It's just like drama and yeah. trash. And like there yeah. was drama on there, but I didn't think it was trash. I really thought people were there not just to like further their careers and, and whatever they were looking for, for fame. Like I really thought that a lot of them were there to actually like better themselves. And I feel like you don't see a lot of that. And they like mm-hmm. talk about that in the behind the scenes, totally. like about how you don't see a lot of their growth and, and stuff like that. And I feel like we didn't get to see a lot of that stuff, but like mm-hmm. I got a lot out of it. Like I got so much out of that in yeah. terms of like watching them go from like person to person trying to find their match. And I know it's strategic, but it's also mm-hmm. like you see the rejection and you see the yeah. frustration and it's like speed dating. Like yeah. three months of fucking speed connection when that's would probably happen over the course of like, you know, like a couple, maybe like a year or two, depending on how much you date. But like, yeah, I thought it was You're- cool. It was really cool. I really enjoyed it. And I hope they do another one because it was really entertaining. But yeah, it is like, you have to remember that it's all the ups and downs of like a two year relationship smashed into like a couple months. So yep. that shit what do you crazy. expect? Yeah. Uh, well, Brie, thank you so much for being on this podcast. If you want to check more out about Brie, not this Brie, that Brie, uh, <laughs> add Brianne Williamson underscore um, if you see uh, anyone who is parading as her, send her a <laughs> DM with screenshots because she's got a fucking catfish, and we're all we're all rooting for that catfish to go away. <laughs> I would actually, if the catfish is listening, contact me because, like, I think that would be the funniest video. <laughs> Just having my catfish expose themselves on YouTube. It would be interesting. I would love to hear the behind the scenes of why they did it. So I am Brianne Williamson's catfish. This is my story. These are our lives. <laughs> These are our stories. <laughs> That'll be my first, first short doc. Oh, my God. That's so funny. But, uh, yeah, guys, that is so awesome. Thank you so much for being on. Um, thank you for listening and subscribing. Be you. Be queer. Stay safe. And we will see you on the next episode.